Okay. Um, so for the free response question that you guys looked at on the AP Classroom, for the most part, things look really good from what I saw. Uh, for those of you guys who had completed it by at least this morning. So we're given a, um, a sample of gas in a thermally insulated container. And it says there's a movable piston, which is initially at state A. Uh, as shown in the graph, graph of pressure as a function of volume, it says the gas is taken from state A to state B by a, quote, adiabatic process. And the dashed lines represent isotherms, right? So this, remember, an isotherm is a region of, like, uh, basically pressures and volumes for a given gas at, a, at one temperature. Um, and so at, along these dashed lines, you could have a pressure and volume that's changing, but the, the sample of gas is at the same temperature. So if we're going from state A to state B, it's going from one isotherm or one temperature to another isotherm and another temperature. Um, <clears throat> it says, let W be the work done on the gas, Q be the energy transferred to the gas by heating through conduction, convection, or radiation, and delta U be the change in the internal energy of the gas during the process. First question is, is work greater than, less than, or equal to zero? Briefly explain your answer. Um, well, if we look at the graph, remember, um, how do we know how much work is being done? Well, we know the equation for work is um, negative P times delta V, or pressure times a change in volume. And if we have a pressure versus volume graph, how do you get the product of pressure and change in volume? Well, that's just the area of a P versus V graph. So if we go from state A to B along the solid line, all that shaded area all the way down to the zero axis right there in red, that is the work done on the gas. So there is some work done, uh, but that doesn't tell us whether that's positive work or negative work. That comes from our equation. So um, because it's negative P delta V, up here from state A to state B, the volume is decreasing. So the change in volume is negative. And if the change in volume is negative, that tells us the work has to be positive. Okay, so it's, if there's a positive amount of work being done, work is greater than zero. Question two, I think everybody I looked at got this right. Um, Q is zero, and that just comes from the fact that they call this an adiabatic process. And remember, an adiabat adiabatic process is when there's no, essentially no time for heat to transfer, or it's just incredibly thermally insulated. Um, and so it just must have been a quick process. So Q is zero. <clears throat> uh, and then part three, or the third part of part A, is says what's uh, true of the change in U or the what's true of the change in the thermal energy? Is that greater than, less than, or equal to zero? And briefly explain your answer. Uh, the easiest way to go about this is to appeal to this equation, which is known as the first law of thermodynamics, where the change in internal energy is equal to Q plus W. Because remember, these are the two ways a system of gas can change its internal energy, either through heating, conduction, convection, or radiation, or by positive or negative work being done on it. So we've already said that Q is zero and work is positive, and so that means the internal energy must be positive. Essentially, the, it's got to go up. Um, there's another way to get to that same answer, um, I guess. If we go back up here, and a couple of you guys did this <clears throat> in your free response question, but like if we go from state A to state B, we already said that it going from one isotherm to another isotherm. Um, and some of you guys said that it's going from a low temperature to high temperature, and that's true. But if you're going to use that line of reasoning, you really have to make a case that state B is at a higher temperature than state A. Um, and how do you do that? Well, Remember, if we've got our ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, uh, and we solve this for, let's say, well, the number of moles in that R is a constant, and so we get that P times V is proportional to T, assuming that these guys are the same. <clears throat> and so temperature is proportional to the product of pressure times volume. So in order for you to say that uh, state B is at a higher temperature, you kind of have to use the values like what is the pressure at B? 
what is it, sorry, the volume at B, do that for A and basically show that temperature is higher. And, and if you can make the case that temperature is higher at B, and you say that temperature is related to the internal energy, uh, and you'd say, well, because the, because the temperature goes up, that must mean the, the internal energy is also going up. Like, that's to, I think from my end, that's a valid way of going about it, but that's more work than just appealing to the first law of thermodynamics like that, okay? All right, part B <clears throat> says, if the temperature of the gas in the initial state is 200 kelvins, or Kelvin, what is the approximate temperature of the gas in state B? Well, we just kind of talked through conceptually why we'd expect the temperature to be greater. So the question is like, how much greater is that actually? Well, in our pressure volume graph that we have here, we've got pressures, we've got volumes, and we've already talked about the fact that like these, these gases can also have different temperatures. So there's actually three variables in our ideal gas law that can be different, P, V, and T, but the number of particles are the same or the number of moles, and this is constant. So if we rearrange our ideal gas law, where we get, uh, I'm just gonna divide by T on each side, so we get P times V divided by T is equal to N times R. And like I said, these two things have to be the same no matter what state the gas is in, whether it's state A or state B which means the pressure at one state times the volume at that state divided by the temperature at that state has to be the same as the pressure at another state times the volume at another state divided by the temperature at another state. And so you can kind of get this equation that at state A, these values have to be the same as the, the, the well, I guess the, the value of this calculation has to be the same as the value of this calculation. And so for state B, it's got to, all of that has to be equal to everything at state A. <clears throat> and so essentially we're looking to try to find out what's true of the new temperature at this state B. And I just pulled all these values, pressures at state B, volume at state B, pressure at state A, volume at state A, and the given temperature at state A. And if you plug all those values in from the graph, you should be getting a, a temperature of about uh, 428 Kelvin, like that. And there's, there's other ways you could use the ideal gas law to get to the same answer, but it's essentially in the end, you end up, you end up doing the same thing, okay? And then the last one says, is your numerical result for part B right here consistent with your explanation for part A? And remember part A was asking about, well, part three in A, was asking about the internal energy. And so in one, we've got the temperature and the other one, we have the internal energy. So let's briefly justify your answer. Well, um, in part A, the third part of that, like we said, the internal energy of the gas would go up, right? Um, and you specifically have to say here that um, it is consistent because if the temperature increases, that means the internal energy must also increase and vice versa, right? And so the fact that we got a higher temperature for state B is consistent with the fact that we would expect the internal energy to go up from state A to state B, essentially, right? And you wouldn't have to have this equation, but this is kind of telling us, like, uh, well, kind of telling us, yeah, the relationship between the temperature of a sample of gas and its energy. And for a given particle, right, uh, temperature, you can calculate the average kinetic energy of a gas particle. And when we're talking about the internal energy of a gas, that's really what it is. The internal energy of a gas is like, how, is, how does a gas particle store energy? It doesn't have internal structure. It's just a, a point particle. So the only energy it can store is kinetic energy. And so this kind of is kind of the link between the internal energy of a gas, uh, which is the kinetic energy of all the particles and its temperature.